I'm very nervous. I've been doing this for years and I'm nervous. That's the way it should be. Hello? I have four uh, love poems. Uh, first of May haiku. This is on the theme of pests. How are you doing, dear pests? <laughs> it's nice to see all of you with your little antennae. We're going to start with a sacrificial poet. Ah, you arrived? Good. Come to the back, we saved you some seats over here. Yep, these, these are for you. Thank you, darling. You're welcome. I'm short. <laughs> that was it. That's good, thank you. Hi there. So, tonight I don't have a poem, but I have a curse. Some of you know already I come from a little remote island in the Mediterranean Sea, and we are very famous because we curse and we uh, and our curses are rhymed. Ed in sella frazzigare lo lassena e pane. Arrabbiatus che sugane chi si ande su dolore, infine su nu puntore chi disperda sa zenia. I roughly translated that into English, and it goes wow. like this. May their remorse keep them lying awake in bed. May they rot in jail surviving on water and bread. May they hurt like mangy dogs burning in pain. <laughs> and it looks terrible next to that, you know, but yeah. it's, it's incredible that they did that, though. Step right up, folks. The mystery. The star you've waited for. And the protege of the original sin. I am the light I'm buried in. And the more and the flame and the prayers for the insane and everywhere and nowhere please remember my name <laughs> It's a vibration, it's an energy that resonates. And while I appreciate the word on the page, it's that vibration that makes it come alive. Words are stronger than steel, they're very powerful and yet they're transported on the fragility of breath. And that, but you think, well, breath is not all that, you know, breath is, pretty damn strong it keeps us alive and it's uh, breath means spirit and it's that spark of spirit which unites all of us I mean it, it takes a little bravery to you know bear your soul in front of people listen to me real close we're fighting in that summer rain you're coming back to me up the dirt road like a kicked dog just so I can kick you again and pour whiskey on the fire Listen to me real close. You're putting daisies in my hair and I'm rolling you a joint. Get on your knees, baby. Let me take you to church. Get on your knees, baby. The Paul McCartney record's on. And in that moment of synchronicity when you connect with your, the witnesses, because we all need witnesses, and it also promotes that understanding, you know, compassion and empathy for someone else, because when you're right, uh, you... Put yourself in someone else's place. Um, there have been so many people who have come to spoken word who have never written a poem before. You know, it's kind of like a, a church with no denomination, and um, you can feel like you're part of it, even if you're in the audience. Force us to run our teeth on the poisoned apple that bulges out of the lens throat. Know that we welcome you for the electricity in your lines versus just as veins, wrinkles, just as waves 
is the elan that an earth asleep on its cyclical stance needs to remind itself that it still harbors a diasporic bloodline that emanates exuberance. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, ever since I was a child, I've spent years daydreaming. And I think a lot. I spend most of my time thinking. And I, you know, I, I joke and I say, my, my room is so small, I have to go outside to change my mind. Or I have to go outside to, you know, to finish the sentence. But the imagination um, can allow you to transport yourself beyond the walls. And now, please give a very warm welcome to our resident poet of spoken word, Antonia. <laughs> Spies. They are everywhere, here, there, in restaurants and schools and mosques, your closet, your bed, your last paragraph. I've been trying to put together a collection of poetry. I sent them out into the world like little orphans, you know, and, and our creations are like our children. We want to, uh, people to like and accept them. But I wanted mainly to find them all a home under one cover. So that's my greatest hope, is to so that they're all together, <laughs> like a family of poems, under one cover. That's pretty much it. Thank you very much. Thank you. The curse is time. And the, the curse of time has a counter. Maybe I will use this. Good. Come on, all you cool cats, for here by hangs a tail. And they'd hang you by yours were you ever to tell about what's going down in the visible world every day. The cascading torrent of time. As you struggle across hot sands that used to be stone. It's so uh, I was gone for a long time in the summer, so I left my grandma like a frog <coughs> to look for every three days with like a clue of where to find it in the house. It's a bit like a treasure hunt in the house and in the garden. And so her job was to find all the frogs, and half of them are here, half of them are inside. What do you usually say when people ask who you are and where you're from? Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll usually say it's complicated or it's a long story or I lived in eight different countries. So Uzbekistan and Shanghai are like two of the last countries I lived in before coming here. I don't count Indonesia because I was there for only a year. When, I, when people ask me, I usually say that my mother tongue is both French and English. I started speaking them approximately at the same time. Yeah, I mean, when I knew that I could now perform my poems, I wrote them with a different approach. Um, about making it for others rather than making it self-indulgent. I will try to make it accessible for people who don't have the same experience. I have poems that are about the bazaar in Uzbekistan, you know, with all the, the spices piled up, uh, or, you know, the place where we buy fresh mangoes and avocados in Ghana. Um, and it's definitely, it's definitely something that has helped me, especially when I arrived in France and I was a bit, I was quite taken aback, even though I, I'd seen it before, um, punctuellement, <laughs> like occasionally. What it claims to be a first world country, it claims to be civilized, but there's something very cold about, you know, 
supermarkets and all these like high consumerists. Like in a hamster wheel or a mouse's cage. When we cross the street, everyone can go in any direction, walk anywhere. You bump into people and you're making sense out of choice constantly. I mean, I don't know if you see your poems in this way, but like, I sometimes see mine as like, kind of, you know, going and grabbing things that you find in your daily life very coincidentally, and then you kind of make sense of them through a poem and maybe associate random things. And I was wondering how that ties in with your practice of dumpster diving. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> I did not expect that. Um, my grandma and I did Les Encombrants, and you know, I would always find, especially in Paris, because people have a lot of crap here and they're always like leaving their crap around and like they have, they just seem to, they just seem to have too much stuff and they don't know what to do with it. Like I've never, like I, I could have never found this much stuff in another country. People will throw out or like leave out like books and scarves and like this plant, I found it on my birthday. Um, like a lot of things in this room are things that I just found that people just leave um they just don't seem to value they just see things as um finite they see their resources as finite um so yeah uh the power of observation i think is really important for that also when you're writing poetry right because like you said you want to um put all these little details that no one notices and sort of encapsulate them in your writing how green the leaves that sing in trees how light and cool the breeze how deep the joy beneath the skin, how strong and potent the brew. Now I've sort of recognized how it's really cheesy and not the best, but I still really enjoyed The Faults in Our Stars because because of this, this, this idea that I think a lot of people would see as naive or hippie or whatever, but I still love um, about how the, the universe just wants to be observed and how, you know, you can't, none of us can... None of us are gonna fulfill like amazing destinies, but what makes a life worth living, the book essentially says, is is to be an observer of the universe and to notice the little things, even without dumpster diving. So I started doing this before I watched Amélie, Amélie Poulain, but I, I absolutely did collect like photos that I found on the street or like bits of people's handwriting and I sort of logged people's handwriting like a... Um, like an archaeological journal, you know. So oh, I could show you that yeah, if you want. <laughs> yeah. Um. Ah, yeah, here we go. So yeah, these are things I found in the street, and I kind of like tried to make up a story about, you know, who they were. I always add them when I find some. These are all people that you found in the street. Yeah, these are people I found in the street. And this is one of the log of hieroglyphics because for people that I know who have like illegible handwriting <laughs> so I would sometimes like practice copying what they've written That's trying amazing. to decipher David Robert Brimet, so I'm going to sing a song. Let's see. The, hopefully you guys like this one. Oh, we like them all. <laughs> yes. It's called uh, Ghost. Going great at the first and second base. I thought I 
about the, uh, the ashes and the smoke of this atomic bomb, but it's also about the smoke and thoughts, the blindness before a screen. Comment aurais-je pu éviter de le voir? Quatre fois au musée. Quatre fois au musée à Hiroshima. J'ai vu les gens se promener. Les gens se promènent, pensifs, à travers les photographies. <laughs> Tu peux me dire pourquoi tu as choisi le canal Saint-Martin bah, Parce que j'aime bien l'eau. L'eau, ça apaise. Ok. Cool. Et là, on est en semaine. Euh, donc, du coup, c'est plutôt cool, agréable. Genre, ouais. le week-end, tu jamais de la vie Bah, il fut un temps, oui. Mais euh, tout maintenant, c'est devenu trop euh, hype pour moi. <rire> Paris se meurt <rire> Je pense qu'il y a un poème dans ça. Ouais, carrément, il y a un poème dans tout. Et là, franchement, il euh, y a un sujet. Un poisson mort. Ce qu'il faut comprendre, c'est qu'il y a 10-15 ans, le canal, c'était pas ça du tout. Les gens s'appropriaient pas du tout l'eau. Ouais. J'adore la Seine, c'est loin de chez moi, mais la Seine, c'est euh, bien parce que quand on est proche de la Seine, en fait, les bâtiments sont. Bah, c'est moins dense, donc on a beaucoup plus de lumière automatiquement. Donc on a l'impression d'avoir de voir le ciel, euh, alors que quand on est en ville, bah, le ciel, il faut aller le chercher. En fait, c'est une succession de parcs qui va jusqu'à Bastille, parce que le canal, il passe en dessous. Donc on est sur l'eau, ça rend pas compte. Ah. Je suis informaticien, hein. c'est ça qui... <rire> qui paye mes factures, c'est pas la poésie. Hein. <rire> J'ai vraiment commencé à écrire euh, dans le train, en allant au boulot, parce qu'à l'époque, j'étais... Euh... J'avais 45 minutes à aller, 45 minutes retour euh, au minimum. Moi, dans ma démarche, dans tout ce que je fais d'artistique, il n'y a vraiment rien de sérieux. Donc la poésie, c'est cool, j'adore, ça me fait du bien, ça fait du bien aux gens, c'est cool. Mais quand je mixe, c'est pareil, euh, je fais aussi un peu de photos, voilà. Je ne suis pas un vrai artiste, je suis un peu un imposteur. Mais euh, j'aime ça, je fais ça sérieusement, mais je ne me prends pas au sérieux, J'ai pas de prétention. Il y a des gens qui vraiment euh, ont fait les choix dans leur vie. Ils ont fait le choix de ne pas faire d'informatique <rire> et d'être artiste. Et ben moi j'ai fait le contraire, je suis informaticien et ça me va très bien. Euh, je mixe sur vinyle. Alors je suis pas un DJ connu, j'ai pas de compte Instagram. Avant, avant de mixer, moi je pose tous les, tous les disques que je vais jouer, je les pose sur ma. Je pose toutes les galettes. Il n'y a pas une galette qui est dans mon sac que j'ai pas écouté parce que j'ai besoin de l'avoir dans mon oreille. Mon intuition c'est qu'on se fait des idées des, des, des chansons. Parce que voilà, c'est le cerveau, il travaille. Il les, il les met dans une cage, je ne sais pas, il, il les transforme, en fait, il transforme la musique dans la tête. Et en fait, ce qu'il faut, c'est vraiment l'écouter. Et quand on l'écoute, on a, en tout cas, sa vraie sensation par rapport à la musique. Avant déjà, très souvent, je, je me demande ce que je vais lire. Parce que jusqu'au dernier moment, je ne sais jamais ce que je vais lire. J'essaye d'être euh, le plus vrai au moment euh, où je vais, euh, je vais lire quelque chose. Donc je me pose toujours la question de qu'est-ce que je devrais lire à ce moment-là. Et ça peut dépendre de plein de choses. Ça peut dépendre de la personne qui est juste avant moi. Ça peut dépendre de plein de choses. Je me dis, bon, ce texte-là, elle a fait ça. Bah, C'est cool, je vais être dans, dans la continuité. Je vais lire ce texte-là. Voilà, parce que je ne le fais pas pour moi, je le fais vraiment pour les autres, je suis dans cette démarche-là. Bonjour tout le monde, je m'appelle Anna Moudra. Moudra c'est en ukrainien parce que je suis petite ukrainienne, petite réfugiée. Et Moudra se traduise comme la sage. J'adore enseigner les gens. Mais il y a une meuf dans ma vie qui fait ça mieux que moi. Cette meuf est charmante, elle est amante de chacun de vous parce qu'elle s'appelle l'univers. En regardant les gens, on apprend à en parler. En regardant le chant... On apprend à se taire. Sur scène, je regarde les gens et de temps en temps, je fais une petite photo et je vois des visages parce que je je c'est flou pour moi. Je ne me concentre pas. Je, je essaie de faire un effort pour, pour capter. 
mais on capte l'énergie de plein de façons, pas juste de manière visuelle. C'est super important, j'écoute, j'écoute les réactions. À chaque, chaque ligne, normalement, on peut susciter une réaction. Au début, j'avais du mal à projeter. Je me rendais rendu compte que j'avais du mal à projeter parce que j'ai une grosse voix de base et j'ai passé toute ma vie à la contrôler, à pas faire peur aux gens. Moi, très souvent, j'ai envie de tranquilliser les gens. Donc ma voix, elle est tranquille. Les changements sont microscopiques telle une chorégraphie d'Acarien. À chaque tour, une histoire s'écrit, tandis que la matière se pétrit. Alors l'air pénètre la chair et se répand comme là. Le long de la structure, on entrevoit l'élévation que susurrent les levures. Au réveil, dans une boîte en pierre ou en fer, on y allonge des portions de chair. La chaleur s'installe, comme lorsqu'on forge le métal. On chauffe comme un corps après les funérailles, rappelant aux esprits aguerris que seule la mort de la vie vraiment nous guérit et qu'à la fin, notre chair se transformera en pain. Amen. La, la littérature, elle est assez intellectualisante. Et la poésie, non. Parce qu'on n'a pas besoin de comprendre, en fait. Et euh, la poésie, elle se ressent avant tout. Dans la poésie, en gros, tu, quand moi, comme je la conçois, hein, tu peux y aller, quoi. Tu as des choses à dire, euh, euh, tu peux mettre la forme que tu veux. Tu peux, le néologisme, euh, voilà, c'est courant. Euh, tu peux euh, parler avec un langage euh, street. On va trouver ça trop cool. <rire> Et est-ce que tu as une time différence euh... Sadomaso, jamais je vous promets. Tu ça après le Non mais, euh, est-ce que t'as déjà eu quand même côtoyé le milieu français poétique Non, jamais. Non mais c'est là, j'en ai, ai presque fait une religion en fait. Euh, je sais ce que j'ai gagné en venant dans ce milieu-là. Et euh, je dis pas que j'irai jamais dans les open mic francophones. Mais euh, j'aime beaucoup l'esprit euh, anglophone en fait. C'est quoi la différence C'est bah, la bienveillance euh, de fait le politiquement correct euh, dans certaines choses. Et moi, ça me va parce que Paris, c'est une ville assez hardcore de manière générale. Donc, euh, je suis suradapté à cette ville. Et je pourrais très bien aller dans d'autres dans trucs euh, avec des francophones et, où c'est un peu euh, parfois différent. Moi, franchement, j'adore. Euh, J'y vais pas euh, tous les euh, lundis juste parce que euh, j'ai rien à foutre le lundi soir. Il <rire> euh, y, y a toujours des belles surprises. Et très sincèrement, s'il n'y en a qu'une dans la soirée, c'est déjà beaucoup. Parce que je ne sais pas dans... Il se passe pas tous les jours des, des choses dans les vies en fait. Parfois, euh, voilà, dans ma journée, je rencontre personne. Hein. Donc euh, si, euh, si tu fais une soirée et tu rencontres une personne euh, où il s'est passé un truc, bah, tu te dis bah, c'est déjà pas mal. Quoi. C'est lui Non, non. <rire> Nous allons vous interviewer aujourd'hui, notamment par rapport au poème que vous avez écrit quand vous étiez jeune. Vous voulez, Merci euh, d'être venu au rendez-vous. Voilà, mon vous Dieu, voulez... les poèmes quand j'étais jeune, ça remonte à 50 ans. Et on alors... plus. Mais si, on Même pas un par petit. Il y a un poème dont je me souviens qui est toujours assez dans ah. ma mémoire. C'est le poème de Prévert qui s'appelle Le ah. ah. Il y avait une phrase qui disait euh, une excuse euh, avec des crêtes de toutes les couleurs sur le tableau noir du malheur, le beau. La poésie est partout à Paris, voilà c'est ça. Monsieur, vous appelez Chéri, je l'ai enchanté. Vous êtes poète Nous sommes poètes. Ah bon Nous sommes poètes tous les trois, puisque vous venez de le trouver là à l'instant. Là il y avait de la poésie il n'y a pas longtemps, il était rose. Et la mairie est repassée. La mairie tue la poésie. Bah ouais, c'était. Merci beaucoup en tout cas. Next, please welcome Christina to the stage. Mignonne, allons voir si la rose... Mignonne, allons voir si la rose, qui ce matin avait déclose sa robe de pourpre au soleil, has lost, that evening, the folds of its crimson dress and its color. On est bien peu de choses. Et mon ami la rose me l'a dit ce matin. À l'aurore, je suis née, baptisée de rosée, 
me suis épanouie, heureuse et amoureuse au rayon du soleil. Me suis fermée la nuit, me suis réveillée. Viens. pour pour devenir français j'ai passé un test un examen de, de langue qui a certifié euh, Macron certifié que je parle très bien le français. Ouais. C'est pour ça qu'il a gagné. It's like mastering an instrument, a language, and that's the one that I have mastered. In, in French, I don't have all the nuances. So I write in English with some French influence or some use of French vocabulary or whatever. There's an intensification of language, <coughs> intensification of language and meaning, mm -hmm. uh, often but not always. It's a kind of condensation of experience, like I have a sense of, am I speaking from my core and do I drop down into this place in me that is really like, I'm speaking from really within me and this is really flowing from that place. And it feels very different when I'm in that to doing a more surface kind of reading, right? So, and it feels like I'm really, I guess the vocabulary I would use is it feels like I'm really present mm. in the moment, in the here and now, and I'm connecting with something which somehow has some truth and meaning for me that, and I want to speak from that place where it really means something to me and I really feel that, yeah. That's not quite the right word. I really, but I'm really speaking from it and from that place in me where it's, where it's true. But it's, it's a bit like being, feeling that you're in alignment with yourself. I think that like, um, it's truth in the sense that Like, like you can say anything, like, like I've just said, and then I said some, oh, something, and, oh, and then I said, oh, that's not quite the right word. Or you can say something about yourself, and you go, no, that's not quite it, right? And you kind of know when it feels really right and really true. Mm -hmm. And with poetry, I don't know if the cat <laughs> is appearing on the, the camera. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Apart from Christina, this is my entire family is now <laughs> in, in shot. Um, there's a quote I liked from Jean Cocteau which translates as something like poets are liars who tell the truth. I'm quite with the idea that all, most truths tend to be quite partial and in some way wrong and untrue. But at the same time, you can really feel when you are speaking something that this is my experience and this is a valid understanding of it and this is it expresses what I have lived or what I'm still living. Or... Behind every face smeared in lipstick there's some kind of trick, the sick joke, a kick in the pants as she asked me to dance, snowfall, mind blows, showers and dead soap blur the ink on her prison letters. I'll never survive the night of my country that has no walls to keep us in, keep them out or it's 6,000 cities. Bright sodium, garbage trucks that run guns to meth labs built on old churches. The priests have exploded in their subtext of the neon nuns. There are none. Someone is waiting for me, it's true. Someone is waiting for me to crawl on my belly so as not to hear the most violent of sounds. A whisper. A whisperin' is a coming. Hey, boy. It's like being a poet is a kind of a, a way of being where it's just your always kind of observing 
and translating into words, right? Translating your experience into words. The poem is about this experience and the more the the experience of being with that blank page or feeling that thing that then flows into something or playing with words and then suddenly something starts coming that's not just playing anymore and it's but that, that's the way I work you know, it's like people say the cliche about Paris is right you know, they say oh an inspiring place to write poems or look at those flowers you should write a poem about them and I never do that and then you know I'm sure other people do yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah I was wondering if you could tell us at all about like what you do as, for a living and how it relates to the whole blank page thing yeah I'd love to um, so I'm a gestalt psychotherapist and that's a kind of psychotherapy that is all about uh, authentic expression of self in the here and now, it's not necessary. You're not trying to find the truth in Gestalt psychotherapy, but you're trying to be authentically you, authentically who you are. <laughs> and it's a room where we, we go there to hear each other's voices. I hear all these different voices and, and there's different moments for it. You know, they may, there might be dark moments that, that they've been through or it might be joyful moments or they might just be having fun and kind of trying to make us laugh. It'll, it'll be theatrical, right? This is like sometimes what you do. And it's just such a live, intense experience. Okay, please welcome to the stage uh, the person who's been filming surreptitiously from the back. Please welcome Joe to the stage. Today, another sacrifice of flesh to the heels of my Doc Martens. I will fall out of step, movement stuttered in a black leather shrine. Soon now, a second offering of mucus to the cotton-tipped swab, testing self for the sacred right to company. Originally I thought I'd have it with like ambient music in the background, like some kind of sort of electro-stroke poetry, wow. right? but I never did. To inhabit that quiet, that small place, that character is... And I thought I would need some kind of something to like attract attention and have authority. So I wore this top hat that I bought for 10 euros in a street market, right? And, uh, and that stuck, having a top hat, that's become the tradition. Yeah. What about the bell? Well, that we introduced, uh, I introduced about, uh, I think probably about three or four years later, because uh, we, we, we didn't used to have a time limit. But we did one night where people went on and on and on. The theme, the theme was family, and it just <laughs> felt <that> like <laughs> people had a lot of. There were a lot of people in that room who needed to do a lot of therapy, because they were. It was coming out through poetry and said, and they were none of them were sure, and it wasn't. It was surprisingly uninteresting, but the the the, set, the egg timer is just fun because you can see the sound is you know, and it immediately starts flowing and it's kind of running out and it's kind of, yeah. I love it. You know, your time is up when it's up, and uh, you can't argue with that. We shallow buried her in the bosom of that winter. When the snow danced on our shovels and waltzed in my uncle's beards. Until my sister, Janine. My sister. She was finally swallowed. <laughs> How much sadism do you think is involved in being a host? Uh, a fair amount. Do you want to come and sit? 
The road to hell smells of stale smoke and insults meant as jokes. The dust bunny is real and she is in a cozy corner I cannot reach, collecting all the things I meant to say. I'm walking round and round, wondering where I put it and what it even is anyhow. I'm still in a new spot at the table. I'm taking a new spot at the table just to get a different perspective. Please welcome to the stage, Henry! Henry to the stage, everybody! The second one is a prose poem uh, called The Hardest Poem I've Ever Written. <laughs> Actually, it wasn't that hard. I mean, it's not hard to start a poem. First thing first, stare at a word. Manish Tana Halayla Hazan Mikol Halaylot. Why is tonight different from all other nights? Strange faces in the crowds, no pillow to recline behind on our back. I I don't I think everybody knows what's going on in politics right now. We're gonna start with a light subject. On the fourth of August twenty twenty, there was a huge explosion that happened in Beirut, where I'm from, and it was devastating. Some people blame the politics. I blame Jessica. She fucking wished me a blast. <laughs> I had uh, one of the greatest wishes that I've had was from my grandma. She told me, I wish that you live as long as living suits you. And I think that's cute. Are you feeling inspired right now? I certainly think of my stuff as, like, if I'm sharing the words to a song, I don't really think of them as lyrics, I think of them as poems that I happen to sing. I feel like there are freaks in my head that I put out there, and therefore it's a cabaret of the freaks that I use, not, like, even judgmentally, but I guess more endearingly. It's usually just like a, like a collage of thoughts, feelings, sometimes there are things that I've heard people say in the street or my friends, and I'm like, that's gonna be the bearded lady, or I don't know, so, yeah, they're just facets of, of, like, of everything, I feel like the whole life, the whole quotidian and everything is just uh, inspiring in general, so, like, I wrote a song, now it was like one of the first songs I wrote, it's just like a little ditty called Captcha Please, and it's like the captcha that like asks if you're a robot and you have to like identify the things and whatever and I just thought that that was funny and so I made a song about somebody having a robot stuck inside of them and then I was like oh well then maybe I'll have this character to introduce this song and then now that's just become a character that I write new little monologues for sometimes but yeah I think that I I, I genuinely don't really I don't feel like there's like something trapped inside of me, but I realize that a lot of the work that I make is about some sort of demon or something trapped inside of someone. So there's something there. So it's like, I don't know what it is, but in my subconscious, there's something there. I'm like, I'm in here like with all of these things and just like walking around and doing all of like, I have a lot of rehearsals in my room where I'm just exploring characters and this and that. And sometimes I'll be like, okay, I want to, I want to be this character and I want to talk about this, but I don't really know what to say, so I'll just kind of talk to myself as that character and then things will come out and I'm like, oh yeah, okay, I'll tell yeah, let's keep that. The walking dead don't dig the living. They're sitting, waiting for a day. Going from point A to point B, click, click, delivery. But I want revelry, and I want revelry. And it's your friend's dad hanging out of his daughter's bedroom window looking for possums to shoot. The baby gun. I do really enjoy the feeling of 
like sharp left turns so I guess if I'm making a full show if there's a moment where I think this is a humorous thing I would very soon after want to do something sad or scary or boring or I don't know and like as soon as something is kind of sentimental all of a sudden go into absurd or and I think that that's kind of that's how life is I just love not knowing what's going to happen The grass has grown tall and the beast has gone I remembered its long neck How it swayed, it was running fast So we sped in the turn It's usually a blur, more or less. And that's why afterwards it's hard for me to... Because I can't really remember how people... Like, I feel very present with the audience in the moment, and then afterwards I'm like, I don't actually know what just happened. <laughs> like, it just kind of feels like it was a dream. As I get older, I'm less and less like, oh my god, what have I done? But usually it's, it's a bit of that, like, fuck, I think that nobody liked it, and everything was shit, and oh god, like, this is the moment that everybody realizes that they don't like this, and now... You know, so it's like there's a lot of that um, self-consciousness, of course, but um, but occasionally after a show or after an evening, I'm like, oh, okay, I actually I felt all right about that. So. Oh, you're gonna go up those killer stairs? I'm gonna go up those killer stairs. Okay, I think I'll film you going up them, but I'm too lazy to actually. <laughs> Are you hosting on Monday? I am, yeah. Cool. But otherwise, I'll see you next week. I will try to come by. Yeah. Okay. Next up, a poet uh, very close to my heart that I've been following for a long time now. Please welcome David to the stage. <laughs> touch and flowers shatter, children scatter, his stink will choke your soaring spirit. Fasten your feet in concrete and throw you off the bridge. He is the bad smell in your fridge. From dust or shackles, grind in our lungs, in our camps, dusted to death, we engineered to the stars. He's 21 and yet shows signs of strength and assurance that could have made me fall for him in the Stone Ages. But now I am repulsed. The words are all blessed too. The words like fingers touching, trying to know, trying to feel what is real, to pray. Words are at war with waters. That's what human heads do. Tell stories. Cri mon enfant. Si tu aimes les éclairs, si mon enfant, mon enfant, prendra un bain de minuit dans le grand océan. Si tu aimes la mauvaise vie, ton reflet dans les temps. Bye, Dad. All I thought you meant to me. All the trees, threadbare, heedless, inside a road sea. Bye, Dad. Your beard, your money, my lead. I spun these fingerless gloves, these dreams where my blue gape nails become the horizon, a silly escape. You see, I never needed escape, just a dark lagoon to catch the water in my ear. Méfie-toi, mon amour, de la longue route où tu disparais. Oh, you hear you very well. Hey, you want to hear the music? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Reading my own poetry uh, in front of an audience. I'm not always totally in control of what my body is doing. Um, you know, 
it's almost, well, it can be, not all the time, but, uh, but it can be almost like a sort of trance state um, where your body is, is doing things that you're not fully aware of. It's funny, I'm the opposite. When I'm doing poetry, I'm, I'm, I'm there. When I'm acting, I'm not, I'm not there. It's the opposite for me. Poetry, I feel like I have a stick in my hand. I have a, a, a conductor's stick in my hand. I feel really there when I do poetry, when I do poetry. It's kind of like a sermon for me, more poetry is like a sermon where those, you know, those guys and gals on stage, you know, spitting, talking gospel. They look like they're not there, but I've, t I've watched some interviews and most of them, they're so, they're just entertainers. They, they, know, they, know, that it, they know that they are just conducting the crowd. And I, I, I feel like, I feel like that when I do poetry. But other things, I disagree. I have no idea what I'm doing when I'm <laughs> performing. Without further ado, please give a warm welcome to our first poet of the evening, Jack! Thank you. Because Sabine is not here to take my picture, you'll have to remember me. <laughs> so, on the theme of smoke, I have something here called, uh, I should give a, um, what are those things Disclaimer. called? Disclaimer. Um, disclaimer? A disclaimer, yes. I'm going to read three of the most depressing poems I've ever read. <laughs> the first is called Hand to Mind. I come from a family of smokers, people secretly wishing to die. <laughs> because death be not proud, but also only obscurely the hand invisible in front of your face. <laughs> as a Jack, as a poet and as a friend, to me he's a bit like the sun or the moon. Like sometimes he's there and sometimes he isn't. Uh, and when he isn't there, he's probably in some way or another, even when he's not writing, he's either working on his poems or the poems are working on him. And yeah. we're like, we were like we're the day after the full moon or something today anyway, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. Jack's here. He was full last night. Yeah, full <laughs> Big fat moon. Chop down the cherry, lest it drop of its own accord. I suppose if there's any differentiation between the two of you, it would be dimension for you. Dimension? What's it for you? <laughs> Who are you, friend? I forgot. <laughs> Would be would be a sort of additional dimension, but it's one that is horizontal, going this way, as opposed to Rufo, which is when I say well, I mean by depth, that um, it comes out of, whereas you go come from. That's good. That's good. That's good. And you drift. And I drift. <laughs> Something I appreciate and have noticed on more occasion, Bruce, when you're reading is that you will, you know, you've got the room, you grab their attention, and then you'll throw in a kind of a, a wild card. And people are like, did he really just say that? <laughs> did he, you know? Um, no, thank you. I've, I've, been like, I've been like that in my art career my whole life. It's like, even, yeah, when you're so successful, you can be successful or have all these great ideas, but always, I always, I always try to reserve 5% of just complete chaos. Of complete, you don't know what the shit is gonna happen. When I was 20 years old, I was gonna go to New York and visit my grandmother for a summer, and and I heard about this thing called Slam. I didn't even know about it, you know. And then I, I saw this this cafe called the Brooklyn Moon Cafe, which is still there actually. And, uh, I was going there a lot, and um, I was going every week, and I wasn't getting any I wasn't getting any love, as they say, you know. I wasn't getting any love, not like. Um, not like I, I would say one of the best things about the, the spoken word here or the Paris community. When new people come, we, we mother effing welcome them. Right. We welcome them. I mean, you just welcome as a human being. They weren't mean to me there, but they certainly didn't welcome me there. So this little trauma, I got up there and it was like week after week. Maybe my poetry wasn't good, but that doesn't mean anything. I was trying my best, as you said. I was trying my best. And finally, the host, his name was Cool Fari, like it was like Q-O-O-L-F-A-R-I, he had dreads, he was 27, I was 22, he was 28 or 22, so for me that's like a, a, hero, a superhero. He finally got fed up, 
and they called me on stage, and I didn't even get like a, you know, I, I basically, I didn't even get an intro. You know, I didn't even get a, oh, welcome, you know, welcome, you know, just kind of, okay, you know. He got really upset with the crowd, and he said, hey, man, this guy's been coming here day, week in and week out, trying his best, and you guys need to show him some love. That's not fair. That's not what we do here. Please welcome Bruce to the stage. Woo! Jealousy takes her top off on Retina Beach. I mean, I, I went to see a movie last night, which was uh, the new Dumbledore. Oh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and the special effects are so spectacular uh -huh. that when I came out, the springtime was a special effect. <laughs> the cars were a special effect. I mean, everything was. It was fantastic. I mean, the shape of... Uh, 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 the, the, the bushes in the park, which I uh, yeah, I was gonna I was gonna give a drug a drug metaphor um, analogy. Let's say that a lot of the poetry you see in the world is actually like diluted and cut down to the kind of cocaine. Let's say cocaine people. It's like the cocaine you see that's cut with sugar and everything, and you sell it on the streets, right? But that's not. But yeah, like the football game or even Dumbledore. Maybe it's a little bit pure because it's artistic, and then the football game, which can be artistic, it's still cut down poetry. It's still cut down, diluted. You know, it's not the pure. It's not the pure off of the off of the tree, pure thing. Right. And that's what I mean. It's like it's there, and I'm not saying that in a good way. I'm actually saying that that I think we should be aware that it's out there. But when you say, hey, let's put poetry in a movie, people are like, wow, that's so, that was so poetic. But it's like, yeah, but, you know? Right. I mean, well, we're, we're, you, sorry. Yeah, no, no. no, no. <laughs> I was just going to pick up on your drug metaphor. But yeah, if you buy sort of lousy street drugs that have been cut with all sorts of stuff, it's not very good for you. But if you're living off 100% pure drugs, it's not great for you either. Exactly. So, you know, poetry... Uh, I love poetry. I love the intensity and the power of it. But everything in moderation, kids. You know, exactly. Don't, you know, don't, exactly. Don't, don't live off pure poetry. Like in anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, really. Yes. It's, it, it can get too much. You know. It can, uh, it's, it's a heavy world. Have you ever had like, a world, phase where you were living off like, too much poetry? Yes. Yes. I wrote tons of poetry, you know, for a couple of two-year period. It would be around about the time when we met. I was living off pure poetry. Um, and you, you can't do that. You can't carry on like that for, for too long. And we have friends, you know, whose lives have, uh, have taken bad turns, you know, from, in part because of, because of trying to live that life for, for too long. It's emotionally uh, exhausting. You know, you don't have to be... Uh, chain smoking in order to consider yourself a smoker so, you know, um, so I'm not writing poetry at the moment um, but I still consider myself a poet and it can seem a bit presumptuous or a bit pretentious to say I am a poet so sometimes people you know, say well I need to get an MFA before I can say I'm a poet or I need to have published a certain amount in magazines or I need to have published my first chapbook or my first collection or there's something I need to have done before I can say I'm a poet but or whether you're actively writing at any given moment or not being exposed to poetry is changing you as a person uh, it's changing your way of seeing the world let bird wings pummel heartbeats to a pulp their yellow beaks break west and east winds so what if their fuselage is blue melancholy has never been the affair of a single federation let anger rise and break out from the ribcage, flailing arms and fisted hands at the world, at a time when a bird that falls from the sky is a loss to all peoples. The whole, the economics, the value system of poetry don't make sense within a kind of conventional, conventional economic uh, system. I mean, it's a citizenship. It's like being, an, it's like a nationality. That's what it is. You know, people come and go, there's new faces, but the community has been one of the few kind of constants in my life. Yeah. Um, and do I consider myself a citizen of poet land? I don't know. But certainly this, this, this particular community I consider myself a, a part of, and I'm glad, you know, glad to be a part of. I'm happy that it's here for yeah, me. Yeah, mine, mine too. Me too. Yeah. I, mean, I came here essentially knowing no one. And uh, I had a list of, I looked up on the internet of open mics. I came here 
Um, but little by little, I was accepted here in a way that I had never been accepted in a similar community at home. Someone who performs for the first time of her life, actually.